So we're going to start this whole series doing food preservation stuff. Kind of looking at old fashioned techniques on it. But before we get there, let's come look at this. It's our orchard here. And we got some pretty neat growth going. You see we got a, a papa tree right here. Back over there, we've got our, uh, that's a plum, our uh, pomegranate, got a raised bed there with some onions and potatoes in it. We can't grow anything else out here because the deer will get into it, and we haven't finished clearing yet, so the deer fence isn't up. Right here, look at this little guy. See if you can see that. Yeah, that's our banana tree starting to sprout up. So we're uh, making some progress here, but I wanted to... Uh, to show y'all some of this stuff here so you can kind of see how our food force is coming along. We'll be adding some more trees here next week and uh, we'll show y'all how to plant those. You can see we've got our sawmill set up over here so it kicks the, the uh, sawdust right onto the orchard. So we got a big old pile of manure and then cleaned out the corral. So nice, uh, nice little manure pile. We moved some of our trees over. So these are the ones that we're a little bit concerned with. So we moved these peaches and uh, from our other area where we used to have the orchard at and uh, that was a little bit uh, a little bit scary in that regard because we were concerned that we had, we didn't we didn't do it when they were dormant which is really what you want to do you want to move them when they're all dormant so we didn't do it when they were dormant so we kind of lost out on that but uh, anyway so let's talk about let's talk about sauerkraut right so why is this remotely important if I can grab a seat here, top of the sawmill. Why is this a important thing? Well, food preservation, old-fashioned food food preservation, has a lot of merits to it, considering the state of things right now, right? So just the, the natural order of gas prices and electricity going up and that sort of thing. So it has some merit in that uh, we don't have to we don't have to have to use electricity to preserve our cabbage, right? And, uh, and then we get the natural probiotics for it and, and all that stuff here. Let me set this tripod out here, guys, so I'm not having to hold it. Maybe that'll work a little bit better. All right, there we go. So anyways, um, sauerkraut has probiotics in it, right? But sauerkraut that you buy from the store does not. Uh, there's, there doesn't have any of those enzymes or, or those, that bacteria in there because it's all been killed in the canning process. And if you can your sauerkraut at home, you'll deal with that too. Uh, but you'll get the flavor a lot better than what you can get at a, uh, any type of store-bought um, sauerkraut. So it's a way of preserving your cabbage to get it through the winter time. So this is not preserve your cabbage to last you for 10 years. This is to preserve it so that you're having some type of cabbage meal over the uh, and, and actually able to use that cabbage uh, over the course of the next eight months, nine months, maybe a year. And uh, so it's really important to understand what it's intended for. It's not intended to store your food long term. The other thing to realize is that inside that sauerkraut is a probiotic uh, or a bacteria that's growing and in uh, and, and that fermenting process. And so um, the that fermentation process that's taking place changes uh, constantly. So the only way to stop that is to uh, either kill the bacteria, i.e. boiling it, and then it doesn't change flavor anymore, or to pop it in the fridge where it doesn't actually kill it, but it just slows it down to where you don't notice it anymore. Or obviously you could freeze it, but uh, then we lose the benefit of why are we doing it. So really what we want to do with the sauerkraut is we'll start at our first step, right? So our first step is we simply clean the cabbage and cut it. Now, if you're buying store-bought cabbage, you definitely want to get it cleaned um, and get that stuff off of it. But then pull that outer layer, uh, that outer wrapping off of it, and we're going to use that later uh, when we actually bottle the sauerkraut. So I'll show you all that in here in a second. But what first step is, is to go ahead and cut it. Now, one head of sauerkraut is about perfect for a one gallon uh, mason jar. It fills it just about to the brim. Um, and so obviously some heads being bigger, some being smaller, maybe a little bit off, but that seems to be about the right ratio. Now there's different ratios of salt. Generally you want to be about 2.2 to 2.5% salt per volume of sauerkraut. Same holds true when you add a little bit of brine to it. Um, but uh, that's about where we want to be. We want to be about 98% sauerkraut, 2% salt uh, in that range. Get too much salt in there, you won't have enough bacteria growing, you won't have that fermentation process growing, and uh, what you end up with is just a really salty cabbage. It's still safe to eat, it doesn't taste that good. Um, and then you'll get enough in there, you'll get spoiled cabbage. So. Um, 
really that's what we're going for. So sauerkraut, kimchi being kind of the same sort of thing, right? So if you're, you're from that area, and I'm sorry, I know I'm kind of a mess today, guys, been working all day, but, um, but anyways, um, sauerkraut and kimchi being t effectively the same thing, kimchi just having different spices with it. Now, um, we're gonna go, so we're, we, we've got it sliced, we pulled off our outer layer, we, now we need to, uh, we, we got our, 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 our salt measured out, so for one head of cabbage like this, it's gonna be about a tablespoon and a half. There's different recipes online, but that's about where you're going to end up being at. Uh, it is fairly forgiving on that amount, but again, just don't go overboard either direction and you'll be fine. But one and a half tablespoons is what I use for just about every head of cabbage. Now this, uh, we start now, next we want to start taking those shreddings. And so we're going to put a handful of shreddings there in the jar, and then we're going to pound that down with our, um, with a, with a, uh, uh, a French dough roller or, or, or dough roller of any type, some type of wooden wooden dough roller that pounds it down. We're trying to break that sauerkraut up, get a little bit of the juices to release. We're going to add some salt, a little bit of salt to that uh, as we're doing that, a little bit of that quarter or that uh, teaspoon, tablespoon and a half, sorry. Uh, we're going to add a little bit of that to that as we're pounding that up. And now we're going to continue adding sauerkraut and adding a little bit of salt using that tablespoon and a half all the way to the top. So just keep adding a little bit each handful and make sure you have a little bit left to add there at the end. And we're going to pound that uh, really, really uh, well to make sure that we're releasing all those juices. Okay, and we'll let that fill all the way to the top and we'll go through the entire uh, head of sauerkraut or head of cabbage. Now, at the very end, you should be have no cabbage left and you should have no salt left in your tablespoon and a half that you measured out. So now the next step is to let that sit for about 30 minutes. For about 30 minutes, we're gonna let that sit there and let the juices from the sauerkraut come out and uh, and see where we're at. You don't have to do this step, it's beneficial. I usually skip it just because I have other things to get to, um, but it is the better way of doing it. So we'll go ahead and uh, and let that sit for for 30 minutes and let the let the juices pour out of the sauerkraut. This gets us a better idea of how much water we need. Before we do that, let's go ahead and we'll take that leaf that we took off at the beginning and we're going to shove that onto the top, um, and that's going to hold those little pieces of sour uh, of the sauerkraut of the of the cabbage down, uh, so they don't float up to the top of the water. That's why we wanted that leaf there. Um, it just makes a nice, you know, basically works the same way as if you were to put a piece of cheesecloth at the top, but this way you just get to do it with what's there and you get to eat it. So kind of beneficial in that regard. And then, uh, and then what we're going to do, we're going to make up our brine. So usually for a jar like this, one cup of brine is sufficient. So I'd, you do one cup and it's uh, one and a quarter teaspoons to one cup of water. And I use filtered water uh, and I just use it at room temperature. Yeah, it doesn't dissolve the salt quite as well, but salt's going to get dissolved when it goes in there and starts the, uh, starts the process, the fermenting process. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour that in there. Now, I used to do it to where I poured it right to the top, and that was all I did. Now I just pour the whole cup in there, and I don't worry about it. Um, it's, uh, it's just not something that, like I said, sauerkraut's pretty forgiving, um, and so you don't have to be that exact with it. But, uh, but certainly, you know, take that with, a, with your grain of salt, no pun intended, um, and make sure it, there, there's USDA food prep stuff on there, so make sure you watch that stuff if you're worried about botulism and that sort of thing. But uh, this is just how we do it. Again, I'm not a professional chef. I'm not a USDA certified food processing inspector or anything like that. It's just what we do. And uh, anyway, so the next thing we want to do is you want to have a, a preserving lid uh, for your for your bottles um, or for whatever you're going to put it in. Uh, there's different ways of doing this. You can put weights on the top of it. They make preservation weights that you can put on there. Uh, I like these spring lids that we use, and I use the the, the spring lid uh, has a has a vapor seal on it, so it'll allow gases out but won't allow any air in. Um, and so it just continues that fermentation process. So. Now the, the kind of final step is we've got everything all made up in here. Uh, we've got it, now it's going to start fermenting. I put it inside a cupboard and for about two weeks uh, you don't want to do anything with it. Um, after about two weeks you've got nice sauerkraut there. It won't be super um, tart but it'll, uh, it'll definitely uh, it'll definitely taste like sauerkraut and if it doesn't then something's wrong and I probably should throw it out. Now you'll notice every once in a while you get some bad stuff up on the top. Grandma used to do this all the time, right? So when your when your grandma or your grandpa used to make sauerkraut, they they would have this scum at the top because they didn't can it, and that scum that forms at the top is just that bacteria growing on there. Um, we just discard it. Again, take your own health and safety into your own eyes and your your your, your own personal well-being, but we just discard it um, and, uh, and don't worry about it. It doesn't, it hasn't ever affected anything below it. So 
so anyways um that's the uh, that's kind of the next step here is that we'll uh we'll go ahead and make sure that that we have good clean sauerkraut after about two weeks your next step is that you can put it in the fridge and that'll stop the fermentation process or you can do what we do we leave it out on the counter and we let it continually ferment um and uh, and and we don't we, we it, it's constantly changing constantly evolving flavors we find that the longer it takes and the, lo the more it ferments on the counter it, uh, the better it tastes so uh, we do not refrigerate it um, until we start using that bottle and then the, then, then that, that jar goes in the refrigerator but prior to that we don't do any refrigeration with it we just allow it to uh, to continually ferment um, we have found that we generally don't like to eat it till it's fermented for about four weeks uh, we like it again a little bit more tart and uh, flavor and uh and, and and past that like i said i like to allow it to continually ferment and so we don't we don't can it we don't put it in the fridge until we open up that bottle so take that for what it's worth we're going to do this food preservation stuff. We've got a few more episodes coming up on this. Uh, we're going to talk about water, water glassing eggs. Uh, we're going to do salted pork here this fall when we get our beef or our pigs back from the butcher. So uh, we've got some more preservation stuff. I wanted to talk about this because of how expensive food's getting and how ridiculous it is. Uh, it makes sense to understand how grandma and grandpa used to do this uh, rather than modern food preservation techniques, which means basically freezing it. Uh, we wanted to do something that didn't re rely on electricity. So... Um, hope that helps you guys out if you have any questions please post it down in the comments below i'd love to to hear it if you guys got slightly different techniques there are lots of different methods to do this so uh, this is just what we do like i said check the usda's website or this fda's website and they'll tell you how to safely do this uh, but this is just the method that we use thanks again for watching guys really appreciate it